Prenz Jr., voice of Kanan Jarrus from Star Wars Rebels, and welcome to Nabil 6901s YouTube channel, your channel for all reviews on Star Wars products. May the Force be with you. Sir, Supervising Director Dave Filoni. <laughs> Executive Producer Simon Kinberg. <laughs> the voice of Kanan, Freddie Prince Jr. <laughs> The voice of Hera, Vanessa Marshall. The voice of Ezra, Taylor Gray. The voice of Sabine, Tia Sirkar. And finally, the voice of Zeb, Steve Bloom. This just old school honor system style. You raise your hands, I'll pick you, and hopefully we'll get to everybody, okay? I know. Thank you all for coming. I can definitely tell the force is with all of you. Awesome. So who is going to be voicing Darth Vader this season? Me. Me. <laughs> Simon, you go. Oh. Take that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, the same person that uh, voiced Darth Vader in the original movies. Uh, Mr. James Earl Jones, uh, one of the most, I would say, one of many surreal things in making this show, maybe the actually most surreal thing, <laughs> is um, Dave sent me when he first uh, uh, worked with James on the, on the dialogue, um, recorded it. He sent me like voice recordings, clips essentially, um, of the, the dailies of hearing all of the different takes and hearing James Earl Jones untreated, obviously, um, playing the part uh, of lines that Dave and I essentially had written together um, was pretty insane. <laughs> when you grow up, you think like, I'm gonna write lines for Darth Vader, but I'm not actually gonna get Darth Vader to say them out loud. <laughs> uh, and that was listening to Darth Vader say them out loud, so that's who's gonna play Darth. That's such an awesome answer. Have any parents this season? Okay. Yeah, so far. And, and you know, James is great. You don't really direct him as much. He'd sit and say, no, David, I haven't done this in 10 years. Could you remind me? I'm like, no, you're doing it. That's <laughs> <laughs> Matt Wood and I just look at each other and kind of high five when he's not looking. And it's an awesome moment. There were a couple moments in the, in the, in the takes, though, where he coughed or he corrected himself and started over. Yeah. And so all of a sudden you realize there is a man playing Darth Vader. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Darth Vader playing Darth Vader. It's sort of like being a child and having the helmet come off. Yeah. Why don't you guys let us in on those sessions? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, Mandalorians can be. <laughs> I mean, just to watch. Just to Too like... dangerous. They don't trust us. Uh, right, Felicia. Um, I know. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, congratulations on the success of season one. We're really excited about season two. Um, Going into season two, are you feeling any added pressure to deliver to the fans, especially now that you're you know, wrapping it up, adding more characters to the Clone Wars? I don't. No, I, mean, I think maybe they do. The actors could speak to it. I mean, for me, this is like, uh, this month is my 10th year at Lucasfilm uh, creating Star Wars content. <laughs> Sixth uh, was the day I officially started working on Star Wars uh, all those years ago. So uh, it's just for me, it's just fun. You know, um, the story gets bigger, the stakes get higher, it's as it should be. I feel a little bit we're moving into our kind of Empire Strikes Back era for our characters, where they're really challenged. Is the first year is kind of a new hope, and uh, I mean, all their characters are going through trials of different kinds. I think also there's there's a automatic pressure when you do anything that has the word Star Wars in the title. Um, so I don't know that there's the sort of increased or decreased amounts of pressure. I think you always feel a responsibility. It's like writing books of the Bible. You know, you're, you're, you're adding books to the New Old Testament. Um, so you know, once you start, yeah, once you start, you know, the pressure is going to be that throughout. He stole my answer. <laughs> hi, hi, here. Um, I'm Fernando from Chile, and I would like to ask um, Dave and Simon. Um, many kids, you know, are introduced to the Star Wars world through Rebels now. So I would like for you to talk about that process and um, how how is that, you know, important for you. And I also would like to know um, what are your thoughts about the future of uh, the Star Wars world? You know that now that you know George Lucas retired and. 
you know, left uh, new people in charge. Uh, sure. Well, we should, we should both. Um, well, the first question, I, I, you know, introducing kids to, to a new Star Wars or to Star Wars for the first time. I have two boys myself uh, who are actually here who are five and nine years old um, and grew up on Clone Wars as much as they grew up on the movies, actually. Uh, and I see their friends um, are experiencing Star Wars for the first time through Rebels. And, and for us, knowing the responsibility of that, one of the things that was really important from the beginning was to give them the experience that we had as kids, which was the, the really first point of entry being the original films. Um, and so we wanted the tone, the feel, the, the texture of those movies to be really present in the show. Um, and I think you know one of the things that's been really gratifying about the response to the show is that you know hardcore fans and even more casual fans, but who appreciate the original movies, see the connection um, tonally, uh, emotionally, uh, thematically between what we're doing and what George did um, from the beginning. Um, and I think the future of the Star Wars movies, uh, you know, I'm, I'm involved in, in some of the films in different capacities, and uh, I think that same approach of wanting to have the, the, the ethos of the original films is what they're doing in all the different aspects, whether it's the video games or the movies, the standalone movies, um, what we're doing. And I think because of that, um, they feel all of a piece and, and all of a sort of a singular voice and vision, even though there's different filmmakers involved with each. Um, and I think the fans will feel similarly about the films and the other media the way they feel so far about Rebels. Yeah, and I think the future, like you said, is great. And if there's any pressure I do feel, it's that now that there's so many incredible things in play, um, that we want everything to be of a very, very, very high quality. So I think typically, you know, I'll just say when you get to animation, a lot of times you do an animated version of things, uh, people tend to think, oh, it's just for kids, or it'd be simpler, dumbed down, and, and we never had that attitude on Clone Wars, and we certainly have not had that attitude on Rebels. You know, I think it started out uh, in a way that's fun and exciting, you know, people forgetting that A New Hope was originally by George designed for kids, but it was also designed for, so parents would watch it and be engaged. And, you know, when I see the Force Awakens trailer and I get excited about that, I want to deliver the same type of excitement to the audience of Rebels. There isn't a way that I want to take it and have it feel any diminished. So we want every aspect of Star Wars that we're working on at Lucasfilm to be truly great and to reflect each other's great work. Uh, and I think that, that that's kind of the pressure, but it's also you know, better in a way because now I work with more people like Simon and Kiri Hart and Kerry Beck and Rain Roberts, you know, and, and a writing team. Uh, it, it helps that you have so many people that have this love of Star Wars in common to, to help lead the way. It is really like a, a singular family, too. I mean, the people that Dave is talking about, they're, they're the story group um, at Lucasfilm, and they're involved, in, and there is real communication between all the different stories. So we talk to the seven, eight, nine filmmakers. They talk to the standalone film. We are all collaborating together to tell you know, a sort of huge story that each of us tells a chapter of. Hey guys, I just, guys, um, I know you guys have your hands up, but we've got two mic runners on the side, so just go grab their attention and they'll bring you a mic. Good afternoon, uh, Dave Vermillion, Geeks United, get your geek on. Uh, thanks for taking the time out here. You can laugh, it's okay, I get done a lot. <laughs> it's ours, we work it, we rock it. Uh, Dave and, and Simon, uh, Taylor Gray's character, Ezra Bridger, uh, was called a street rat in season one. Um, the, the fans have taken to calling him Space Aladdin. <laughs> uh, even, even his name Ezra is known as a character from, from Disney lore. Are there any other Disney influences or Easter eggs that we should be looking for in season one or future seasons? You know, not that I know. I mean, I, that was a flattering comparison, I have to say, as someone that grew up in animation, uh, loving animation, a, a great film and a great character Disney had created. Um, Ezra's design came about because I was sketching him on my kitchen table at home one day, which doesn't happen a lot, and my wife happened past the table, and I said, what do you think of this? And she was like, hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? What? And she just kept walking, and she's like, well, it's okay, but it looks like everything else. And this was before I changed the design. And, and so, you know, it kind of made me look back at a lot of different uh, characters, heroes, and character actors. And uh, actually, oddly, Aladdin wasn't one of them. 
Uh, if anything, it was, um, <laughs> I looked a little bit Ralph Macchio. That's <laughs> 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 great. I'll be totally honest with you, because, you know, it's like, what was great about this 80s actors, and... Um, when am I going to learn how to punch? You know, yeah, exactly. So, you know, but I don't think there's any... I don't do, like, hidden Mickeys or stuff like that. It's cool for the parks, but, you know, it wouldn't be a... People find those all the time, so who knows? Maybe my designers put them in, I don't know. <laughs> Seb's a secret Disney princess. <laughs> Hi there, question for Dave and Simon. Uh, you've announced that Sarah Michelle Keller is part of the cast, and Freddie, I guess. Uh, can, you tease, uh, can you tease anything about her character or how soon we'll see her and what's she like in the recording booth? Who, my wife? <laughs> That'll be the one. She played the Wookiee in season one. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody believes me when I say that. She plays Chewbacca's lady in, in our show, season two. And I, I talked about this on a podcast a while ago and broke down the entire season two with her and her, uh, her Wookiee presence uh, during the season. Um, outside of that, I can't tell you anything because it would spoil the surprise. Um, but yeah, she's really hairy and has a great low growl. <laughs> Uh, she's a power. She's no. She, no. She's a powerful actress, and uh, you know she can grunt with the best of them. <laughs> Hi, uh, Wilson Geeks with Wives. This question is for Freddie. <laughs> I'm one of those. <laughs> Freddie, uh, your, your character obviously is kind of still shrouded in mystery. How much of the character's backstory did you get when you took on the role, and are we going to find out more about it in season two? Yeah, Dave gave everyone a really, really big breakdown on, on what made these characters tick so that our season one performances would be reflective of the history that, that's, that's gone on so far. So... I knew about his master. I knew about you know Order sixty six. I knew I knew about. I always want to say Protocol sixty six. You know it's Order sixty six. To stop myself, but um, I, I knew about all that and how it affected him and what he did during during that time. Um, that's that's thanks to to Dave and and Greg Weissman when we were just getting ready to do the pilot, that they, they turned into two episodes and, and aired as as a movie. Um, so we kind of knew all that going in, and in season two. As far as uh, Kanan's character goes, you're gonna you're gonna learn a lot about why he is who he is today, why he's the type of teacher he is, his his qualities and his faults, um, and you're, you'll you'll find out a, a lot of that in through a very special character who kind of helps motivate some of those feelings to come out. So you, you'll definitely learn pretty much what your all the questions you have. Those to be a couple, you know, they made you wait three movies before Vader got it in the end. So you gotta wait a little bit. <laughs> But yeah, we give we give you a lot more in, in season two. I uh, ask a question for Dave. Uh, now, earlier in the panel, you mentioned that if the story was right, there are certain characters you might consider bringing back. You know, are, are there any characters from the previous stories or even the defunct expanded universe now that you'd be interested in, perhaps trying to chase that story, or do you just kind of let it come naturally? I think you always have characters in mind that you'd like to, to see interface. Um, we throw names around the room. I mean, everybody in the writer's room is a fan. So everybody has certain characters that they would, they would love to see. Uh, and sometimes you're never sure, like, how serious people are or not, you know, when they, when they bring people up. And you have to be careful with that. Because if you're joking and say, you know, how about we bring Porkins in? Uh, that'd be great. And then all of a sudden, something happens. And you're like, hey, Porkins would fit for that. And then the person's face is suddenly like serious. And they're like, no, 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 no I was joking. And I'll seize on that idea with my sense of humor and be like, oh, no. <laughs> now he's in. But he's not. So, um, yeah, no. And sometimes she, she it only gets so far. But... You know, you never know. I, I'm not sure what makes us decide a particular character's coming in or out. Sometimes, you know, we'll get to talking when we're in the script phase, and we'll have, honestly, recently, a recent problem we have is there are so many cool things happening in the script. I was like, Simon, I literally, I only have 21 minutes and 30 seconds. This would be awesome as, like, a 90-minute movie, <laughs> but I have 21 minutes, and he, he's like, yeah, I know, I've been writing it, it's hard to get in there, so sometimes we'll try to spread stuff out, then we work on this up until the last minute possible. Nothing is ever set in stone, everything is changeable, it's not like we just get the script, that's a blueprint, we follow it, we, we deconstruct it along the way, 
try to get it as right as we can. And luckily, I work with guys like Simon, you know, Greg, Henry Gilroy. Then uh, they're really good at, at you know moving through that as I'm trying to direct it and get the best story we can and changing sometimes a lot, sometimes little. And we get a lot of time too, which I, I don't really I, almost more than in features for me. We get a lot of brainstorming time. So we get a lot of like, you know, uh, blue sky meetings of what should this season be. Um, and, and I mean, we really spend probably months on that. We're doing it while we're also writing episodes for the previous season, but, but um, there is a lot of time to dream um, and to play around. Yeah. Hi, Thomas from Star Wars in the Classroom. Yay. And uh, yeah. hey, go Rogue. <laughs> she is. Um, <laughs> we provide resources for teaching the Star Wars K-12. and. Star Wars Rebels provides some rich ground for doing so. So my question for you guys is, what do you think, and this is anybody on the panel, what do you think are the big lessons that are being taught through these stories? I mean, Star Wars shows you that the good guys don't always win, right? And Star Wars teaches about patience. Star Wars teaches about discipline. Star Wars teaches about a lot of social issues that most sci-fi can't really touch on, um, outside of racism, right? That's one that's in every sci-fi movie. But uh, they deal with a lot of cultural things, a lot of government issues. Um, and in our show alone, we deal with those things. That's, and the, the movies can go in, in much, much more deeper in, in some instances. But I would say it teaches a lot more about real life than a lot of the stuff out there. You know what I mean? Most, most stuff you see, you know the good guy is, you know the bad guy is, and you know who's going to win and who's going to lose. And Star Wars doesn't give that to you. That's, I, I think, why it was always so powerful in not, sorry, in not only my mind, but most people's is because you genuinely relate to it. It's not just, I wish I was Han Solo. You relate to Han Solo, right? You wish you were Superman, or you're a kid if you like DC, or you wished you were Spider-Man if you liked Marvel. But you didn't really relate, well, you could relate to Peter, I guess, but, so that's not a good example, but you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Everybody, everybody relates to Peter. He's a pretty kid with problems, right? So, uh, you know, to me, Star Wars was always kinda, you know, this is the real world, and you can work as hard as you possibly can and do your best and still fail. And it's what does a Jedi do once they fail. And that's sort of what shapes us as a man, shapes us as a woman, as a human, whatever it is. As a I'm, Wookiee, whatever. I, I'm moved by the hope um, that is present in the show. I think it's a great thing for kids to latch on to, especially these days. And um, I love the idea of the spark of a rebellion, that it takes an initial idea and then it's followed through with action. As Freddie said, you don't always succeed, but at least you can have hope. Um, I love that we seem to be uh, giving that message to uh, the younger generation and also encouraging them to follow through on their ideas and that it's worth it to get a group together and not just talk about it but actually take action and do it and walk the walk. So I think it's a great metaphor. <laughs> I, I love that it addresses the possibility of transformation also. No matter what's happened to you in your life, there's always possibility of changing and growing and developing into something better and, uh, and, and seeing a possible future, no matter what the odds. And, and that's really encouraging to me. I'm, I'm a dad, too, and so I love to instill that in my kids. No matter what's happening to you, there's, there, you can always change that. Hi, um, Jason from uh, Bombad Radio, a podcast who's interviewed a lot of the Clone Wars guys and hopes one day to interview you guys as well. Um, I thanked you yesterday, Dave, for a diverse cast in every show. Um, it's, it's amazing to see, um, I specify male and female, but also across the board, and, and The Rebels is no different. Um, another thing you do really well is keep spoilers from us. We don't have the show ruined. It's something I greatly appreciate. Even when you guys boo him. <laughs> yeah. Without being sarcastic, you know, it's, it's appreciated. That said, um, in, the, in, the trailer that, <laughs> in, in the trailer that we've now got on, online and that people are looking at across, across the globe, there are obviously return characters already been talked about. There are some new characters as well. Um, did we see a female and male inquisitor? Is there anything you can say about any of that? I don't know how much you're allowed to say, but that's my question. Hang on, hang on one second. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're having a problem now. They'll come over and whisper in here. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. No, so we've deliberated, and the answer is, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do know, so that's a blatant late, late lie. But I think the fun part about any trailer, right, is once you see it, there are the things that are designed to hit you immediately, like the Rex moment, uh, having Hondo in there, the obvious things you see. and then, But as you watch a trailer over and over again, if they're designed well, 
they have layers and each time you watch it you get a little more out of it a little more out of it so um, those are all the great things that become questions and debated I just had uh, a kid behind stage asking me like who are those other clones are those clones with Rex and I'm like yeah I don't know so, you know, <laughs> and, you know but that's what I want you to be asking because it keeps you engaged and it keeps you hoping and it gives you something to ask me when at these conventions so you know eventually when it gets answered it's hopefully awesome and, and what you want or then no one ever asked me after it's out right that's the funny thing it's always a forward thing I always think we'll get to like and then they'll ask me all about details of season one nope everybody's on a season two which is cool because <laughs> I mean, that means we've answered all your questions I guess about the previous season good afternoon Katie Cullen with after Buzz TV to touch on the previous season, thank you for that segue, mm, okay. one of the big questions was what happened to Ezra's parents? We haven't seen them. Will we be covering that in any capacity in the upcoming season? And given what happened at the panel, will we hear anything about Sabine's family? Mm. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what? What's wrong, Sabine? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Tia? <laughs> I mean, uh, that is fun. I'm about the worst person to ask about what what what's happening with Sabine's story. I don't know anything. I find out when we get the script <laughs> before, like a couple days before the episode records. <laughs> we will uh, be addressing, um, you know, definitely Ezra's parents to some degree. Um, we think it's important. It's you know because it came up. We all notice that kids focus in on that, uh, and it, you know it's something to be responsible with answering that question. And you know now that he has this other family, what happened to his, his mom and dad? And we've had them, you know, visually in the show. You know what they look like. So that will be a part of the story. And I think the nice thing about season two is you get a broader look at all the characters. Now that you know who they are to some level, it's not just Sabine maybe and what her background is, but also Hera and Zeb, Ezra, Cain, and you know it's. A lot of people wanted that. Uh, you even eventually get more of a depth backstory on Chopper and where Chopper is from. So you, you kind of get it all this year. It's kind of it's fun. Do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> of course. That's great. They're all right. All right. Uh, my name is Josh from uh, KBVB TV and Puddle Pirate Productions. And my question actually is for Steve because one, my best friend for 20 years is named Zeb. Yeah, he is. Um, so my question is, is we saw a little bit in season one of Zeb kind of had a backstory. Are we going to go in more into it about his species and what his story is and why he hates the Empire as much as he does? It could absolutely happen. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's, 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 that's an answer Dave? like Dave. Yeah, that was that? very good. She's my mentor. Well, well, I'm his Padawan. <laughs> you don't want to get fired. <laughs> no. Okay. Is there more of a backstory for Zeb? I'll ask Dave this. Uh, Simon, what do you think? <laughs> uh, it'd be fascinating to explore. Oh my god. <laughs> We're all trained by Dave. You can find us all. <laughs> no, I can't. Me too. I'm so evil. <laughs> we go deeper into all the characters' backstory in the second season. Like Dave said, the first season's about introducing them in the in many ways, and also about integrating a new member into the family with Ezra. And the second season, um, we can go a little deeper into their backstories and, and into their interpersonal relationships, too. We got a lot more time season two, also. We don't have to, you know, we had a, a shorter season, season one, so we get more time to explore everybody in season two as well. I feel like in season one, there was a lot more about like the familial dynamics and how, like, establishing who is what within this little ragtag, you know, crew. And I feel like in season two so far, we've really gotten to explore, like, certain uh, pairings that you haven't seen yet will, will you know, within, within the crew uh, happen and, and go on, like, really interesting adventures. I can say that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's and, all um, fine. That's all And great. it's really fun because <laughs> you're starting to see sort of... Um, each person's personalities as an individual um, kind of coming to light. And, and then you do get to find out more stuff about some of us. All of us? Some of us. <laughs> All of you. All of you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Kevin Cleveland from thegeektable.com. Uh, first, just want to say thank you for having this panel on my birthday. It's a great oh, birthday present. Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. Um, this question is actually for uh, Freddie. Um, 
you know, coming from being an actor in front of the camera to doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff like with the WWE and now still being a bit behind the camera, but also in front of the camera with at least the voice role. Um, how does that feel to get kind of back to what you were doing before a little bit more? Um, I mean, we, that's a long, long, long answer. And the short one might sound kind of generic, but, um, you know, I honestly have more fun doing this than any acting job on camera that I that I ever did. Um, we get to basically do a radio show every week, and we're all in a room together. There's no hair and makeup. There's no <laughs> there's no wardrobe people fixing my collar because it moved a quarter of an inch. Um, and you know, it's a lot easier if you're a, if you're a father of two to work once a week in the valley for six hours than to go to Australia for six months and and not see your family. So it, it's not a transition for me at all. I, I wanted to be a, a father more than more than an actor. So once uh, my daughter was born, that was, I already kind of had one foot out the door already. Vanessa, are you crying behind my back? <laughs> no, that was no, Tia. Tia, oh, Tia, Tia that I way. thought Vanessa was, was Tia. shedding tears. <laughs> Tia's shedding tears no, now? I can vouch. He's the best dad in the world. This guy is literally dad no, number one. He no, is, indeed. Uh, top ten. Top ten. But, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, so it wasn't, it wasn't a transition. This is what I did when I was eight years old and now I get to do it and and it looks way cooler because they animated it. <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a transition. I really love it, man. It helps that you're really good at it too. Oh, yeah. well, thank you. There's that. Thanks. Hi guys, um, I'm Sean, part of the machine. I'm right here in the back. Okay. Hey, what's oh, up? Sorry. Hey. Hey. Um, um, first off, um, uh, Andre Blackner and Kami says hi to Vanessa and Natia, so hey, I wanted cool. to tell them. Hi. But, <laughs> but um, uh, I'm a big fan of the show, and I've asked uh, and met Steve a bunch of times. Hey, Steve, good to see you. I always ask this uh, to you um, at cons. Uh, for you guys, with Star Wars having a lot of new toys, um, do you guys own any toys of your characters, or what would you see from the show become a toy? <laughs> I mean, I got two kids, so there's a lot of Kanans and Zebs in my house. Yeah, we've got a couple of Jason Isaac Inquisitors in there. Um, yeah, we got we got a lot. We got we got a lot. They're more for my kids than than for me. I'm not, you know, Rick Moranis in a room by myself. You know? but, but uh, <laughs> but I'll play with the kids and stuff like that. So Vanessa, I, I, yeah, I spent a whole night putting together every Lego set that they sent me. <laughs> so I have uh, the Ghost. I have. Each one of our characters, I think. Don't you have the Nerf lightsaber too? I have the lightsaber. Uh, I have every single lightsaber with the. Yeah, that lightsaber. I have Vader's lightsaber, I believe. Red. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Red. Just throw it out there. (laughs) We all got really awesome uh, stormtrooper helmets with Sabine's graffiti uh, on it, which is awesome. And Vanessa and I got presented with. Um, Sabine helmets made by the Mandalorian Mercs, and it was very, they're And the so airbrush legit. gun, too. Oh, and the gun, and a plaque. It was yeah, lovely. It was really so cool. We're, I'm totally, I just need the outfit now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have we nearly can have, enough. We can make that happen. <laughs> I don't have nearly enough toys yet. I'm going shopping right after this. <laughs> <laughs> I have all of them I think so. Here. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, hey, guys. Christian Harloff from AMC Jedi Council and Shmozno. So the uh, question I have for you guys, Dave and Simon, is because we know the time period that this takes place in between four or five years before New Hope, how many seasons do you guys think it would, it's going to take you to tell the story up to where we need to go and where we all know it goes? And the second part for that question is, let's say a particular movie, a spin-off movie, takes place in that timeline. Say Rogue One, maybe, maybe not. Um, in, in that timeline, how much information do, would you guys be able to get to give the actors some backstory that they might need leading up to that period? Well, I mean, as we were saying, all of the creatives kind of collaborate. We know what each other are doing. So the purpose of that is so that we're always aware of the continuity and the different stories. So if there was a situation where that was happening, then we would absolutely know uh, in detail what was going on and then I could inform uh, my actors as necessary or, or our writers, you know, but and that's kind of the beauty of the new story group scenario is it all is all interconnected uh, and that's the purpose for it to keep the stories all on track depending where people are and the story group is the one that comes in and says I like that idea, but that's going to be happening somewhere over here. So we're gonna have that idea over here and this over here uh, as far as how many seasons we could go? I'm not exactly sure. I never know. I got asked that question 
every year on Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a two-year job, in all honesty, when I started it. That was the most animated series that I'd worked on, be about two years. Uh, so I thought I'd move to Bay Area for two years and move back to LA. I've been there 10 years. So I never know. I mean, I think it's kind of as long as there's a demand for it. Um, I think I do have a little more of an arc in mind for Rebels as the you. And we talk about kind of that bigger picture because we are running up to a new hope. That is a flagpole that we know. Um, so that's kind of a question on how will we deal with that incident in the galaxy um, should our timeline reach that. Oh, hey, uh, James Burns from Jedi News, uh, also writer for StarWars.com and The Insider. A um, couple of two-part questions. First one, um, was it incidental that all of the character names are all biblical? Because that's something that we've noticed, and I don't think you've ever been asked that before. Um, but if you look at all of the names, they are. They're all directly from the Bible. So that's the first part. The second part of the question is... Um, We've already seen there's a new look for Tia coming in season two and uh, some of the other cast. So how far along is season two? Is there a big jump from where we left off at the end of season one? Or is it just carrying on in the timeline and you know, Tia's decided to have a hair done? <laughs> Good question. The name of the question is interesting because it was, uh, I should find the documents we have of all of our, our names that we, we, we tossed back and forth. Um, Greg and, and Dave and, and Kiri and all of us. I mean, no, those weren't the names. <laughs> like, it should be named Dave. Um, yes. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I, I, one of the things we, we did say consciously was that um, there was a biblical sense mm -hmm. to the naming and to the sort of um, seriousness of purpose um, of the original movies. Uh, and, you know, there's a, the, the cloaks themselves have a religious feel to them. Um, so that was, I, I don't know that, at least for me, it was conscious that each one was, and I, I, that is frankly is news to me that each one is from the Bible. Yeah. Um, but it was, we were aware that there were elements of that in the original films that we were trying to connect to. Is Chopper Old Testament or New Testament? <laughs> 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 He's the only, he's the exception. I definitely keyed on the idea of uh, Luke's, of Luke's name, Luke Skywalker. And I like to point out when I get in the room with the writers that, you know, the names in Star Wars are very purposeful, but when you get into the expanding universe, they become often very odd and contain a lot of X, Y's and Z's and, you know, hyphens. And, and that's all fine. But when you're in a medium like we are, you know, Han Solo, okay, the guy's pretty much by himself, right? And that's kind of the genius of George, is that he would disguise this stuff. I didn't think about that when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. You don't know the derivations of these names, but names have a purpose. You know, if you know someone's full name in folklore, then you have power over them, right? Because if you to know someone's name gives you an understanding of who they are. You know, so, uh, you know, I joke, I've got a guy in the crew named Spotswood, and I'm mean, your family, at some point, probably had a particular task that involved, you know, finding the firewood or searching, hunting for something, because that's where names come from. They don't just, you know, to make up a name that is odd, you know, just for the sake of it sounding like a space world name isn't really what Star Wars does. So I think that having these names, you know, Hera, a very purposeful name for the type of character that she is. You know, Chopper, he's a disruptive little character that causes problems. He chops things up. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's blatant, but when the characters work, when you like the characters, it doesn't matter. You just, you just accept them. And so I think that's what we do. We try to create a lot of these names. And you know, like with Ezra, Ezra was definitely a connection to the fact that I liked the name Luke, and it was a real kid's name. And we both actually know a kid named Ezra in our lives. And I'm like, that sounds like Star Wars to me. And Simon's like, yeah, I agree. And that was basically it. We actually wrote an article for Star uh, about the name because we actually went into the meaning. Oh, wow. And um, the powers that be said, no, we can't run that because we don't know whether it's true. So, oh, interesting. So, I'll get it to you. <laughs> there was something interesting. That's cool, man. And some of it is a strange, and I can't remember if, I think there was a slight intention around Bridger. The Bridger, he's the character, he's the bridge between the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy. So there is a bridging of topics. So you get Ezra Bridger. Uh, the wave of all. 
See, and whether we intended that or not, now because of your reaction, we actually thought of that. <laughs> Very well, thorough. Good job, Simon. <laughs> hey guys, uh, Lucas Siegel over here from comicbook.com, over here, comicbook.com and, and starwars.com as well. Um, you talked about, uh, Tia mentioned, you know, the, the theme of family for season one, and Vanessa and I had a conversation about the theme of turning points for season one, where each character had a really specific turning point. Uh, what would you say is a general theme for season two, and, and is there also a character theme for season two like that? Hmm. I thought you answered that actually. Uh, thought, you're always good with that. You're my theme guy. You're so good with that. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I think uh, the season, the way we approached season two was um, sort of new challenges to the family. Mm -hmm. um, from the outside rather than from the inside. I think in, in many ways the first season, the challenge was integrating a new member of a family into an existing family. And that's a difficult thing to do, whether it's a stepchild or an adopted child or whatever it is, a new parent. Um, it, there's a lot of things in real life that are real life corollaries for what the first season was exploring. And I think the second season was now that they are essentially, you know, with their uh, normal familial issues, a unit, a family. Um, it's sort of how do they continue to grow individually and how do they keep stay together as each of them is growing, as each of them is facing new challenges um, uh, and, and, and in some ways grow up. I think a lot of the, the second season is about Ezra um, facing some sort of darker issues um, and being forced to grow up um, through them. Yeah, definitely. It's great. Hi, uh, I'm Scott Murray with the Assembly of Geeks podcast. I'd like to ask uh, all the voice actors, maybe uh, you guys as well. Obviously, one of the things that we really like about Star Wars is the characters and how we can all <coughs> latch on to certain characters and become big fans of them. And you guys provide that to all of us, and that's for sure. As we head into season two, um, what, what are some of the things that you might want to share or can share with fans of your characters that they can look forward to uh, as your characters continue to develop into season two as far as what we can see and what you can share that we're going to see. Do you want to start at that end or do you want to start over here? Well, well, uh, <laughs> I feel like lasers are trained on my forehead. Uh, well, well, we'll see uh, what a beautiful dancer Zeb is. Uh, we'll, we'll witness his cooking skills and uh, maybe a little bit of uh, piloting skills, perhaps. Um, you know, just, just with his rubber duckies in the bathtub. No spoilers here. That's pretty much all I can give you. Sorry. <laughs> Tell me to stop if I should. Um, I think Sabine, like in season one, you sort of don't know why she, well, that goes for a lot of these characters, but she's, she seems very angry, you know, not towards the Empire, obviously, and she, she, she's got these skills that you're like, how does a young girl have these skills? And so I think as season two progresses, you might find out a little more about, like, what is her backstory and what what happened in her past that led her to this point? And yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think you, I mean, I, I've been very excited about season two because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like dying to know what's happened in all of these characters in the past. And, um, it's fun to get to start exploring that. Yeah, um, we see Ezra grow up, so we see what happens as he gets he grows more powerful, more knowledgeable. Um, he is learning new things every day and seeing new things every day. I mean, we saw his first time up in space, pretty much, right? And that, that like, each episode he's coming upon new things. But I, one thing I saw, which I see on this link too, he has a scar now, which is cool. And I just saw for the first time out here watching the, uh, the new trailer. So that's, that's an exciting little thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Hera in season one, um, managed to fulfill her vision, which was to bring a group of people together and you know, unite them with fulcrum and, and get the cell together. And I think she succeeded in doing that. And I think in season two, she can sort of let them do their thing. Now everything is coalesced. We are a bigger group. We have uh, other people joining us. And she can sort of let them fan out and keep doing what they do so well. So I think she'll sort of oversee that and applaud them along the way. Um, like specific growth 
is difficult to talk about for season two because we don't want to spoil things. But based off what you saw in the trailer, I mean, I can tell you a little bit outside of just growth, right? Like he's still on the on the on his path. You'll see him and Ezra go through some growing pains, um, as you would see a teenager fight with their father. If, if their father was teaching them how to play a sport or whatever the family business was, was going to be, you'll see some rejection there. You'll see him look towards others for for advice, which is going to irk Kanan quite a bit. You'll see Kanan have to deal with, uh, now we all know the secret, um, with, with Rex, and that's going to be a tricky situation based on uh, the, the nature in which he lost his master um, from Order 66. So you see a lot of conflict. Dave, Dave addressed the fact that uh, we're all going to be challenged this year. Season one is to establish us as a legitimate threat. Season two is to then see where they're at, sort of like a boxer on the way up. You give them a better fighter every, every single fight. You give them a couple of tomato cans to make them feel confident, and then eventually they're ready for the champ, which is Vader. <laughs> Unfortunately, Vader is Mike Tyson in his prime, so I ain't Buster Douglas. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I think, yeah, what's great about that, listening to you guys and Simon's answer earlier, and we work so quickly on all this, you don't often have time to sit back and look at the bigger picture. But you are so right when you say that each of the characters is really going to have to struggle with who they were and where they came from. And they'll be confronted with those pasts. And they're going to have to make a choice if they're going to deal with those past conflicts and let them go. Or if they're going to let them drag them back down into they were. And that's very true, I think, of all of us in life. And Ezra especially will be confronted with the idea that just because he's been given a great power and a great ability and wonderful skills, um, matching that unfortunately also becomes uh, comes greater evil, and greater darkness, malevolence. And he starts to become aware of this presence in the galaxy, which is a frightening thing. But if you truly are worthy of you know, being a Jedi and wielding the power of the Force, you have to learn to do that selflessly. And that's the real pressure when you get down to it on someone with the ability uh, to use the force. Because ultimately, you cannot wield it for yourself. You have to wield it for others. And that's what the Sith don't realize. So that's all uh, within uh, season two, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. hey, wasn't that the name of Grievous' ship? What's that? Malevolence? Malevolence, yeah. It hey, wasn't man, in the thanks, ship, Freddy. Right? Thanks for watching. <laughs> I know four other things about Star Trek. <laughs> Hi, I'm Katrina Dennis from MoviePilot.com and the Moss Eisley Comic Fort Podcast. Um, I am a huge fan of the Kanan comic that just came out. The first issue was absolutely stellar. And this is particularly for, for Dave and Simon. Um, how does the Star Wars story group uh, expand Rebels in that sense? Like, you guys are expanding to books and uh, comic books and hopefully video games someday. So, uh, how do you guys work together with the other branches of the story group? The comic was easy, because Greg wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the comic was a no-brainer. Greg writes comics, and um, Greg wasn't working on season two with us. So, you know, the opportunity came up to have a comic book written, and it's like, well, let's have Greg Weissman do it, because he's already worked with us. So what happens is um, he writes the treatment, and then Simon and I see it, and we're able to make notes uh, directly on it. I mean, which I know I think maybe is rare in, in the crossover universe from uh, films and television to comics and other medium, but we always get a chance to look at everything that comes by. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it working in other, um, I guess, franchises. That there's not the same kind of integration. Um, so you don't get the... If, if you are the you know, sort of core group that created one branch, you don't necessarily even get access to the other branches until they come out as a book, and maybe you get a free book. Um, but, <laughs> but you certainly are not involved in the process. And this is, it's, a, it's, it's kind of an amazingly small unit for the amount of stuff they generate. Um, that story group that we're talking about is like four or five, six people, maybe, deep. Um, and they got, you know, huge, biggest movies in the world that they're also focused on. Um, while being focused on a comic book spinoff of their animated show. So it, there's, there is just, everybody works really hard, everybody loves it, um, and we are all constantly talking. And there are moments on the feature side where, you know, Dave and me and uh, different writers from different movies are all in the room together working on, you know, one of the films. Um, and then sometimes we bring some of those guys in uh, when we're doing development of the show. And there is, there, it really feels like, it's kind of like what I imagine, um, uh, like 
Facebook or Google or these sort of campuses to be like. It does have this almost university campus vibe to it. You can imagine, I mean, since clones were in that story, I was heavily interested in, you know, just helping Greg uh, with how that would all go. And I think it turned out great. You know, it's one of my favorite things. I think the artwork in it is also fantastic. So that's kind of a, a comic book home run for me. Yeah, I think so. Hi, guys. Uh, Aldo Canepa here, uh, Cougar News and KFI. Uh, you guys, obviously, we just saw the trailer. What was, how was, what was the reaction from the fans like to you guys? And uh, also, we saw Vader in the trailer, too. Will we see an Ahsoka versus Vader battle in there sometime in season two? But the main question first, how was the fan reaction to you guys? That, that's We've never seen it, so our reaction was the fan, yeah. was the fan reaction. Yeah. It was the same as y'all. Yeah. We hadn't yeah. seen it yet. I couldn't believe I was able to stand and sit down again. <laughs> I couldn't move after I was paralyzed. I was paralyzed. worried about you. We had to yeah. make sure no, that I was on a medic backstage because we were worried about Vanessa. No, for real. <laughs> But well, just the sensory overload too, from being on the stage and then getting the the energy from the audience at the same time, and all the emotions that are going on with all of us because we're fans too. It was it was intense. It was and really really yeah. intense. I wish I want to every episode of uh, Rebels. I want to watch it with that sound. I know. Oh, that scream. That scream. Like man, my like we were on the stage. It was like rumbling with it. It was amazing. Also, to get to hear people's reaction to Rex was like yeah. And Hondo, oh. goosebumps, and Hondo, those The awesome. Hondo love was great. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, that was the part that is particularly striking. I mean, having been here and created those characters, mm -hmm. and then to all this time later have a reaction like that. I mean, when I got here, Rex <clears throat> wasn't really a thing at all. He wasn't a character. Neither was Hondo, neither was Ahsoka. We had to, like, you know, plant them and, and help them grow over the years. And I told Ashley in the beginning, you know, Ahsoka, mm, and it can have a good Padawan, look out, you're gonna get, you know, the brunt of this. And uh, she hung in there and I think really won fans over. So it was kind of an amazingly, uh, you know, moving experience for me to have a character like Captain Rex, a clone, cheered at such a volume. And I think that that shows you the real powerful thing about Star Wars and the challenge that we all have as well. I grew up the original trilogy and I love it. Uh, the biggest thing I learned from George over the years is create new characters, create new ground, keep it moving forward. I love the past. I'm incredibly nostalgic for it. But the best work we did on Clone Wars was always the new stuff we did that challenged us as writers to make it Star Wars and a part of the universe. And I think that that, you know, now my hope is that, you know, in another decade, you know, I'll still be at this and, uh, you know, I don't know which of you will still be alive. <laughs> whoever it is that's crawling well, that's onto the, the first scene, time you said that. whoever it is that makes it into the next thing, <laughs> bravo, and whoever doesn't make it, you know. Well, I can't tell you. If I said a name, you'd be like, oh, that person survived. So well, I caught myself there. Well done. But that was a great moment. I wash your car every day, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Steven. Hey, hey. Guys, thank you very much for everything that you've done for Star Wars. Guys, let's give a big, big round of applause. Thank you very much. Chris Velosky, Skywalking Through Neverland. First of all, I shed a tear during the Force Awakens trailer, and I shed a tear during Season 2 trailer back there. But I missed this whole convention. But I want to ask each of it and, and every one of you, how do you feel when you come to a celebration and you see kids and adults cosplaying as your character? Mm -hmm. Dave, let's start with you. I love it. <laughs> it's the number one thing I look forward to. I designed this stuff, I sketch it on a piece of paper one day, knowing that, like, Ventress will walk in the room. And she's yeah. over there in the corner. And I, I drew that outfit on a piece of paper one day. And then, and there it happens, you know. Uh, Bo-Katan's Mandalorian helmet, I drew on a Southwest napkin. You know, and then that becomes a part of Star Wars. It never ever, ever, ever gets old. I was outside the convention and Zeb walked up to me. I mean, Hera walks up to you. It's, yeah. it's what it's all about. And the amount of work that everybody does to make those costumes is, I mean, I just love it. I super appreciate it. My favorite one was last year at Comic-Con, there was a cosplay, Dave Filoni. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> I, wish I, had, I wish I could project from my phone up to the wall, because it was a guy with that hat 
and black shirt, and Dave doesn't want to believe it was him, but I think it was him. You have my wife obsessed with this yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 I tried to track him down. And I saw that guy over there with the hat, and I thought maybe we'd found him again, but that's not, that's not there, him. There's, there's now people that have this shirt and a hat. I think you're all crazy. This is something you guys see. No, no, I appreciate it. It means we should hang out more, maybe, but... <laughs> I'm working on my Dave Filoni cosplay right now. I got the beard going, the shirt. I'm halfway there. Halfway there. Halfway there. Yeah. <laughs> One of the bold things about the show when we started it was, I think the instinct, would be, the, the easiest instinct would be if you're creating a new show and it's the first thing from the new Lucasfilm, uh, essentially, uh, you would you would lean on the legacy characters. You would you would make an animated show based on the brand names um, that everybody knows. And we did the opposite. We, all these guys up here, obviously, are completely original characters. Um, and that was a bold thing to do, and it was something that wasn't, a, you know, immediately clicked and made sense for all the powers that be. Um, uh, and it was an extra responsibility obligation to create characters that were as compelling as the, char as the greatest characters of all time. I mean, that's who they're competing with. Um, and so to come here and see the kind of energy and affection that people have for these characters that didn't exist two years ago, in the world that didn't exist on screen a year plus ago uh, is, is pretty incredible. Like they said, the amount of time someone stitches together a costume based on a character that literally did not exist out of someone's imagination a year and a half, two years ago um, is, is surreal and very gratifying. Hello, you guys. Over here. Over here. Freddy. Right. All I hear are speakers. Oh, that's Dave. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Full-time podcaster, part-time Filoni cosplay. <laughs> anyway, anyway. <laughs> yep, yep. Anyway, my uh, question, um, Dave sent in with Fandom Awakens Radio. Now, Dave, not to be confused with those other guys that did that other radio. But anyway, my question for Dave and Simon, can you two particularly speak on uh, the process of how everything changed around. You know, Dave, I know you, you know, worked with George for so long, and that was, I think, a shock to everybody. So I want, I'm particularly interested to hear what you have to say. And Simon, on the level of the outline George left behind, all the, you know, his notes and everything, how much of those are used? I think uh, I remember hearing you saying something about it depends from movie to movie, that kind of thing. So if you two could just speak on that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, um, from, I forget what year, but it might have been the second year I was at Lucasfilm, um, and I would spend a lot of time with George in editorial, and he would be teaching me um, the way that he cut stars. That has so much to do with the way the films feel, the way the footage is cut uh, together and moved around. And uh, he used to tell me all the time, he's like, you know, I'm teaching this stuff so that when I'm gone, uh, it will still carry on the way I wanted it to. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm going to be here longer than you. That's fascinating. <laughs> you know, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to retire one day. And I'm like, uh-huh, you're going to retire. Well, you can retire from giving me notes today because I have a lot to do. But, you know, it was a great master-prince relationship. But, I, I, you know, I heard about this faraway world where he described being retired. I just didn't really believe it until you know he sold the entire company and then I had to believe it. But you know, I've taken that very seriously. I, I, I feel a great deal of responsibility to George as someone that I worked with for a long time to constantly inform Simon and the rest of, of story team. Yes, I understand why you would think you want to do that, but in my experience I thought that too, but then I would do it this way. Um, and and I, I try to hold the line on a lot of that stuff. In a lot of ways, though, the rest of it, um, we all realize no one is ever going to replace George. It's not, it's just not going to happen. So what I think is amazing about the group of people we have working on story is that it, it is a collective group of people that love Star Wars. And actually, if you, you get to talk to them, they all love different aspects of it. And my feeling from my perspective working here so long is that each person brings their own aspect and love of Star Wars to the story. And together, together, just maybe we can combine to make something uh, like some kind of Star Wars Voltron, Freddy. I was about to say Voltron. <laughs> <laughs> and, Lions and are robots. Maybe that way we uh, you know, are, are coming close to equaling uh, the genius George hat, which I hold you know, in very high esteem, obviously. And, and I think that's the best way to work. I think that we're aware of the challenge. 
uh, we take the responsibility seriously. And my workflow is very similar to the way it was before. It's just now I've got, instead of one person, you know, to go to for the commandments, I talk to a group of people, and together we come up with the answer. And then, you know, the nice thing is, when I say I think it would be this, usually Simon, Kiri, we're all on the same page. So we know what the surety is the way to go. Commandments by committee, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. So, uh, we, we, sh we it was really important to us um, to share the show with George. Uh, I don't know if we said this before. Maybe I don't. Know. Like once or maybe. twice. Yeah. So, so yeah. So we, we we took we when when we finished the pilot, two episodes. We we um we brought it up. We went up to Skywalker um, and screened it for him. Um, me and Dave, uh, Carrie Hart, um, Rain, I think was there too. Uh, people from the Story Group. Uh, and it was the for me, the strangest experience of my life. Where again, the only thing I can compare it to is like the Bible, and you like sit next to God, so, not even like the guy that wrote the Bible, God. Um, and so, and and the you know he was enjoying it, and, and I was just clocking him the whole time. Uh, and the lights came up, and he said, he said it's terrific, it's terrific, and, and really like loved it, and had the same kind of passion for it that we obviously have had for everything he created. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, what Dave's saying is 100% right, and I, having experienced, worked on all the different movies too, in different capacities, um, it's the same process, it's the same respect, love, adoration for what George created, and trying to sort of speak in his voice. I think very much that's what the, what, what the different filmmakers, who all have their own visions and own voices, um, grew up on his voice, and that is the singular text for all of us, all of us across the board that wanted that made us want to be filmmakers, um, and so it's really we're sort of channeling him as we're working on anything Star Wars related. That moment was intense for me. That was like taking in a, a, a final exam. Mm -hmm. You know, I had been learning at Star Wars University for years, and here I've the first thing I've done without him entirely. You know, without setting a story reel where he can make some final note, and uh, mm -hmm. it was it was an awesome experience, and to share it with these guys. I think it really, you know, solidified our group, and we're like, well, okay, we've we've gotten this right, and so that was a great moment. For the us. first time I met him, I'll do a very tell you a very quick story that.